All right, in this chapter, we're going to look at measurements and calculations. All right, our measurements and calculations are a quantitative measure, something that actually um, is defined by a certain set of rules, so it makes it very repeatable. What I mean by that, um, if we're looking at the size, side of a pool and it says that it is three feet in depth, we know how much that is because a foot is measured the same way everywhere. It's a quantitative uh, and approved value. Now, if we were to see on the side of the pool, it's uh, about 17 and we'll just make up a, a W. Uh, we have no idea what that is because it's not a fixed unit. So our quantitativeness, we need, want to have a value, a numerical value and a unit, and we want to actually have it defined in a very set, uh, uh, restricted set of rules. All right. Now, our first one is the numbers themselves. So uh, the unit uh, is going to come later, but at first we want to look at the number itself. Now, we are going to introduce the idea of really large numbers. Now, this number up here, this with the four and the three at the front top there, that is the number of ways you can possibly mess up a Rubik's Cube. You know, you can get those little $10 things at Walmart. Um, that's how many different permutations there are to it, how many different ways you can mess it up. Well, that's a huge number. So we introduced scientific notation to reduce, remove some of these repeated zeros. Now, where that comes in today, we're going to look at um, this number 525, which is not something as big. 525 is actually a relatively normal number. But we could represent it at, as being 5.25 times 100, and 100 is 10 times 10. So this is a scientific notation form of 525. Now, if I want to come up here and do that to Rubik's Cubes, I'm just going to move this back a lot more times. Now, we do technically just count how many times you go back. And I've already lost count. But let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 4.3 times 10 to the 18th. So there's 18 zeros after that four, or 18 places after that four. Uh, really pays off when we're dealing with really large numbers. Not so much with uh, um, small numbers. If someone were to say 525 or 5.25 times 10 to the second, that second way sounds a bit odd. All right, but when we need to convert it, we just need to know how we go about doing this. So whenever we want to convert a large number to scientific notation, we just want to remember that we're going to take the decimal that is implied to be there and going to move it to the um, left as far as we possibly can so there's only one number in front of it, one coefficient. So the eight, 82 million becomes 8.2. All right, and to do that, we're moving that decimal seven places. So right here where it says 10, we're going to say 10 to the seventh. That's how you know how many places it moved. So you really do just count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now we can also do the same thing with a very small number to get rid of all these zeros to the left. We're going to move this one, two, three, four, five, six places to get the same type of thing where it's 1.2. And since I moved that six places, but it went left, we're going to say, or it went to the right, uh, we're going to say negative sixth. And then technically, if you look up here and how that's written, that doesn't make any sense to have all those zeros to the left now. That should be written just as 1.23 times 10 to the negative sixth. All right. So um, if we want to go the opposite direction, in the sense that I give you scientific notation and you want to get a decimal number, it says four. You're going to want to move this decimal four places. Now, those two places I just skipped, we're just going to add zeros to them. So that 1.75 becomes 17,500. And if it's a negative four, you do the opposite. Once, twice, three times, four times. Put zeros there where we just skipped. So we should have point with three zeros and then 175. All right, so let's give it a practice. If I were to give you this on the test and ask you to convert it, we really are just going to count. One, two, three, four, 
five, six. We did go from, uh, we moved it towards the right, so that's negative. So it's going to be 6.98 times 10 to the negative sixth. And this one, 2.589 times 10 to the fourth. Can I move it four times, once, twice, three times, four times? Going to have to add a zero there. Get 25,890. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Now, the interesting thing about units, at least for us in this class, is that America is the last people or the last group of, uh, of, of citizens on the planet that are still on a unit other than the metric system. Everybody else on the entire globe is officially on the metric system. Now, that conversion has not been fully uh, embraced uh, totally. Like, for instance, and in, um, if you were to go to England, they really do still have stones on the side of the road that are about a mile apart. Milestones. So they're still using miles, but they're technically switching to the metric system on most of their stuff. We're about the only ones that haven't. That's created some problems here for us because we still talk about feet and inches over here. And, ever, and the rest of the world talks about meters. And we talk about pounds. The rest of the world talks about uh, grams and kilograms. And that creates some issue. Um, like, for instance, uh, skip to this slide, um, the Mars Climate Absorber, which was um, something that NASA put up back in the late 90s, uh, we lost it because it basically crashed. And the biggest reason it crashed is somebody did their conversion wrong. Uh, the British also had something, their satellite, called the Beagle, which was going, doing the same thing, going to go scan Mars, crashed into Mars, a really, really high rate of speed because it weighed more or less than it was supposed to. I don't remember which way it went. But both of those were a result of unit conversions that are wrong. Now, what we're doing in most sciences, uh, medical field is a really interesting one. So if on a medical chart you're supposed to put down somebody's temperature and you put 98.6, which is normal body temperature, it's technically normal body temperature in Fahrenheit. Um, in the Celsius scale or the international system or the approved system now, um, that's almost boiling water because water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So if you put that on a medical chart, um, medical billing people can turn it down because they know it's not true. There's no way body temperature was 98.6 Celsius. So nowadays we need to actually make sure we can convert that to a metric system. So that's our biggest hurdle for the average American student is to get us onto the metric system, at least for our measurements and calculations in sciences. All right, so our base units, the only ones that are actually defined based on some outside thing. Uh, we're not really going to look at those definition, but these are the, the base units, the meter, kilogram, seconds, and kelvins. Everything else is based off these four somehow. Now, there are others, but they're outside the scope of this, this class. All right, so length is measured in meters, mass in kilograms, time in seconds, and temperatures in kelvin. Kelvin's probably the only one of these you're not have not heard. You might not know a scale on meters and kilograms, but Kelvin's probably is new. Now, uh, Kelvin's just interesting. It's uh, very similar to the Celsius scale, except that this one doesn't go below zero, as there is negative zero or uh, below zero on the Celsius scale. Matter of fact, ice cream, for instance, at Walmart, those coolers keep it around negative four degrees Celsius. Kelvin, there is no zero. Uh, um, zeros as uh, is absolute zero, and we've never actually got to that. And theoretically, you can't. All right, so that's our units. All right, now when we actually convert to the metric system, we see something beneficial. Um, our English system has weird things like uh, 12 inches is one foot, and one mile is 5,280 feet. I mean, where do these numbers come from? Well, we all know them. That's the convenience of them. The metric system, everything's multiples of 10. What I mean by that, one meter, which is about 39 inches, is equal to 10 decimeters, which is equal to 100 centimeters, which is equal to 1,000 
millimeters. You know, so it's just multiples of 10. After this, it actually goes by uh, three, z three zeros. So the next one, the next conversion they have on the metric prefixes is a million, go from a thousand to a million. And that is micrometers. Medical field actually says MCM. So MC for micro, the mu, the Greek mu, um, is more of a sciencey way to do it. All right. Now, interesting. Um, even though there are multiples of 10, the uh, prefixes tell us those numbers, really. And so if this was gram, a one gram is still 100 centigrams. The prefixes are interchangeable. So it doesn't matter what the fundamental unit is. We have the same prefixes. And these are the ones that we'll be covering in this chapter, or this class. Uh, there are others, I mean, even on the large scale, you might recognize kilo and mega from computer terminology. Well, there's um, giga and tera above that. and um, uh, But they're going to be not necessarily ones we see too much in this class. And even below that, there are things smaller than nanometer, um, but we're not really going to deal with those too much in this class. All right, but these prefixes are ones we're going to see. Um, but that's help us, helps that you'll see that these are just multiples of 10 when we go to do these conversions. All right, when we go to apply other units, volume is the first weird one we see. Because if I back up to that chart, volume is not something there. Turns out volume in the uh, um, scientific world is defined as a box of a certain size. The original one is a very small little box. One centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter in deep makes a cube that is a cubic centimeter. And the volume and then go into that is approximately or defined as a milliliter. Now that being a very small thing, the SI unit just scaled it up and said the box is actually a meter by a meter by a meter. So a much, much bigger box. It still is the same thing. It's kind of like a box. It holds a certain amount of stuff, and we're going to call that a cubic meter. Now, once we understand what that size is, we can change the shape of the box. So get a bunch of centimeters, and then actually we can make glass tubes that are a little bit easier to hold the liquid in them. Uh, graduated cylinders are a very common thing we see in the lab. And what they'll do is they will actually etch these nice little lines on it so you can actually be to get a very accurate measurement of how much liquid is in a tube. Rather than have a bunch of little cubic centimeter boxes, this is up 10 and all the way up to 100. So it'll hold them all. All right. Now, there's various different ways to get the volume in a chem lab, um, but all these are actually fine-tuned a little more. Like, for instance, what I mean by fine-tuned, those are painted on like an assembly line they're not very accurately calibrated. So you see how that liquid is right around that 90 line? Well, that is milliliters, but that's like saying approximately 90 milliliters. Um, it's going to be as much as maybe 10 milliliters off that. So it could be anywhere from maybe as high as 100 to as low as 80. Um, but it's in the ballpark. It's around 90. We're sure of that first digit. It's rounds to 90 milliliters. Now, if I want more accuracy, I use one of these other ones because the hash marks on the volumetric cylinder, this is, or a graduated cylinder, sorry, we have 90 to 100, and we're right at that line of that 100. Since we're right on the line, we could actually write that as 100.0 because we know it's definitely on that line, and we're sure it's on that line because we can see it pretty well. So we're estimating that digit. We're saying it's much more accurate. And volumetric pipettes like this thing, that line is so well known on there. If that's a, that's about a 25 milliliter volume, we can actually put another zero on there. We're a little bit more certain. So the equipment gives us certainty in our measurements. Now, you might not be able to see from a number how certain we are in it, but we kind of can because that digits, the number of digits, how precisely they're known, tell you how accurately you know it. So like this scale right there, um, that says 89.2863, and it's grams. So that right there is a milligram. This is 
accurate down to the tenth of a milligram. And since it gives it, we know it's actually a usable number. It's a it's something that's accurate. Now uh, that if you look, it's a liquid in there. Even if you wanted to try to get this up to uh, 2.864 with adding a drop of water to it, you'd find a drop of water is going to shoot that up more than just a, a tenth of a milliliter. So that's a that's a very small amount of mass there. Um, but this scale is giving us this accuracy. Now I can get on Amazon and get something that looks a lot like this, but it might only uh, have reported this as 89.29. Might not have that 63 because it's not nearly as accurate. We've actually lost some of the certainty in our calculation. But it is something we can get. It's a measure, and it's something that can that can tell us something useful with what we're, with, with what we're studying. All right, length is the next one we're looking at. Um, it is using a ruler. Now this is a, a not an, a not a, a foot long ruler. This is this is going to be a meter stick because we got centimeters here, and um, we are just using these to measure things. Now does introduce something interesting. See this equality, even though the America, uh, even though here in America we're still on the imperial system, inches and feet. Turns out an inch is defined as two point five four centimeters. So we're kind of on the metric system. All right, so. We introduced all this stuff, and I've been alluding to this uncertainty aspect because technically, whenever I see a number listed, I will have a number, and I will want to have a unit, and there's a certain degree of certainty or uncertainty in that number. Like, I just wrote this three foot because what I'm talking about there, that's maybe the side of a pool when the pool is shallow. That's someplace where you don't go jumping in head first because you'll get a headache. Um, and we all know that that three foot that is an estimate. The water is about three feet deep. Now it's going to go up and down because water evaporates. Um, it rains. Uh, that moves. Might be as much as an inch or two below. Might be as much as an inch or two high. Um, but we know it's about that. Now if there's a marking on the side of the pool, don't see this too often anymore, but if there's a marking on the side of the pool and it says three feet, so they've marked the depth for three feet. They might actually be able to put an extra zero there and say they're much more precisely aware of the depth of, or at least that line. If the water's to that line, it might be three feet on the nose. And if we're playing around with NASA, you might want to measure that a lot more accurate and put another zero to it, measure it that much more accurate. So those zeros that we see, it's talking about the certainty or the uncertainty of a measured value, how well we know it. There are some numbers that have an unlimited number of certainty to it, exact numbers. Obvious ones are definitions. 12 inches equals one foot. That's a definition. That's not just like one digit significance in that one foot. That's a definition. Both of those are exactly the same. There is no uncertainty in those numbers. They're defined that way. Other weird exact numbers, think of a pizza. We're going to cut it up, and if I cut it well and cut through the middle each and every single time, my pieces might not be the same size, but the number of slices is going to be fixed. It's going to be a nice even number. In this case, it's eight slices. It's never going to be seven and a half. It's never going to be six and a half. It's going to be eight. It's going to be a whole number. That's an exact number, too. Now, the inexact numbers are pretty much everything else. If we go back up to the pool, we put water in there. That water might hit that line and stay there. But you all know water in a pool, it's going to move around some. It's going to evaporate. It's going to move. So there's an inexactity to that number. It's going to vary some. All right. For instance, what I mean by vary some or a measured value. So we want to talk about the uncertainty in a measured value. So what I have here is I have a picture of a the, the meter stick, and I have a nail laying next to it, and we want to get the length of it. All right, if we look really close, we can see that the length of that nail is right between that hash mark and that hash mark. All right, now this hash mark on the left would be 2.5678. So that hash mark is 2.8. This one here is 2.9. So the length of the nail is not 2.8 centimeters or 2.9 centimeters. It's somewhere in between. 
and we're going to estimate how far in between it is. Now, this is realistic because I got multiple students. Multiple students gave me multiple different values, uh, but all of them are just varying by that last digit. That is an estimated digit. These are all perfectly acceptable because we all, once we see this, know that this last digit is estimated. It's not precisely known. It's not on a hash mark. It's a educated guess based on our technique. All right, but that's perfectly acceptable. We still count it. It's still a usable number. We just always know that that last digit has a little bit of uncertainty to it. And we see the same type of thing in our pool analogy. When we see the depth of the pool is three feet, we know there's some uncertainty on that three. It's right around there, but it's not going to be exactly three. But if I paint a marker on the side of the pool or a fill line, I can actually define that much more accurately. That's why I got more certainty to that line that we've painted onto the side of it. So there's a certain amount of certainty just on those digits. Now, anytime we use a scale that has little hash marks like that, we end up having to estimate. So even on those volumetric um, cylinders, we would be estimating those. So if we look at closely on these, these hash marks are on every milliliter. That's why I have an extra digit because the milliliter is known. It's one of these hash marks. That extra digit is our guess. How close to the line were we? Were we on it? Were we not? That estimated digit is something that we estimated by actually looking at it. And I didn't, I'm guessing at that. This is a terrible picture. I can't tell if it's on that line or not. I'm just assuming it is. All right. All right. So which of these is an SI unit for time? It is the second. And the SI units, just remember, it's just those four major things that we're going to see. So we got time is a second, temperature is Kelvin, mass, weird one, kilogram, not the gram, it's the kilogram, and um, 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 length is the meter. All right, on to our uncertainty and how it's going to actually... Um, work into our calculations. Now, before we actually do anything with calculations, we've got to analyze what we're going to call a significant figure. So in any given number, there are digits in it, obviously. So 28.31, there are four digits in there. My simple question is, which ones of them are significant? Well, we know from what we just said that that last digit is an estimate. Um, we are going to say that that's true on every calculation. That 28.31, that one has some error to it. But we know it's close to that, so we're able to say it. Um, and we don't want to ever change that because if I were to change that number and say, well, it's 28.3, we're not saying that we're certain about the three that way. If we rewrite it, now all of a sudden we're saying we're not sure about the three. So we're not going to round that. If our scale told us that the one was our estimate, or that hundredths place was the estimate, we put a number there to show us the estimate. All right, but which of these digits are significant? Turns out all of them are. So even though we guessed at that number and it's an estimated digit, we still say it's a significant digit because it's the estimate that we are sure is an estimate. So that number has four significant figures. I don't know why I wrote that. I normally just say sig figs. All right, so whenever we see a number, we might just ask how many significant figures they are. That's just asking how many of those digits are likely to be ones we can trust. It'll be always the ones on the left and then one digit of estimation. All right, so how do we know if it's just a number written down? Well, there's a, a, a few gimme, gimme's. If I have a number, it's got no zeros in it. So uh, 21.31. No, no decimals in there. All four, because it's written that way, are significant. All right, the zeros are weird. Leading zeros we can ignore, always. That kind of makes sense if I were to think about 21.31, because if I were to write 21.31 and put a zero to the left, that doesn't mean anything. Um, that's one way you could write your check and not go to write on your, that's, that's one way you could write a zero on your paycheck and not go to jail. So you put it on the other side, that's fraud. Put it on the left, no one, everybody's going to ignore it. 
This still just has four significant figures. All right. What throws people off on the leading zeros is if I put a decimal and then put a bunch of zeros to the left and then write that number, all of a sudden these zeros seem to be significant because they have a purpose. I can't remove them. Well, you kind of can. We could rewrite this in scientific notation and say that's actually 2.131 times 10 to the negative fourth. And now all of a sudden, putting the zeros there makes no sense. So because this number can be written as this number, leading zeros are never significant. So when I first write up this um, 0 0.002131, I'll rewrite it over here, 0 0.002131, I really am just going to count those digits and say four significant figures. All right. Confined zeros are kind of obvious. If I put 201, that zero, even though it's a zero, um, is very necessary. And I can't do anything with it, even with scientific notation. It's still going to be there. It's always going to be sandwiched between two non-zeros. Whenever you have that, it definitely counts. That has three sig figs. All right, so leading zeros never count. Confined always count. And then the trailing zeros, numbers to the right. I'm going to write a number simply like this, 100. Those zeros to the right don't count unless we make them count. And how do we make them count? We just rewrite that number and we put a decimal. If there's a decimal point, trailing zeros count. If there's not, they don't. So over here with this 100, there is only one sig fig. But over here, since I put the decimal, now there are three. All right, and the last thing on here about the exact numbers, uh, one feet, one foot equals 12 inches. That's a definition. Has an unlimited number of significant figures. We can say it's infinitely significant. All right, so let's practice these. 1.173, how many significant figures? Four. How many significant figures? Three. How many significant figures? Seven. And that's just because that's the numbers, right? That's how many digits are in each of those. There are no zeros, so I just flat out count the digits. On this one, I have zeros. My first number is a non-zero. Last one's a non-zero, so everything else in the middle counts. So that is eight significant figures. Same with this one. 1.003, all four count. 12.707, all five count. Sandwich zeros count. You can't ignore them. All right, over here, leading zero, it never counts, so this one only has two significant figs. But 1.0.1700, 0 0 .1700, there's a decimal. Trailing zeros count if there's a decimal. So this one has four sig figs. Same here. All four count, all four count, zeros after the decimal. This one, sandwich zeros, so we're right at seven. Non-sandwich zeros, they are trailing zeros. There is no decimal, so none of those zeros count. This only has two significant figures. But as soon as you add the decimal, now they all count. We're right back up to seven significant figures. All right, so how many significant figures in this number? 1,000 or 17,501. It's all sandwiched in. Five. How about if I remove that one, change it to a zero? There is no decimal, so we don't count the trailing zeros. This one only has three significant figures. And another one of these. No, zeros to the left don't count ever. So that's only three significant figures. All right. And I'm going to pause this video so we have a two-parter on this.